It's 2020 and there is a revolution underway. Hi, I'm Kathy Smith and welcome to On Health, The Art of Living. What is the average American eating? Why is gut health so important? What is this new research? If Americans get five or more servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Shocking. I was sucked in after the first chapter. The more that you focus on the path, the yeah. more likely the goal will come to you. The podcast is available wherever you listen. So just search The Art of Living with Kathy Smith. Hi, I'm Kathy Smith and welcome to On Health, The Art of Living, where each week I bring you the latest information on how to live a healthier, more vibrant, more passion-driven life. So until around age 30, your muscles grow larger and stronger, but then at some point in that third decade, you start to lose muscle mass and function. You can lose as much as three to 5% of that muscle mass each decade after the age 30. The term is called age-related sarcopenia. Now, if you're active, you can still lose muscle if you're not training and eating properly. So why is all this so important? Well, that's the topic of the show today. I'm a big believer that strong women stay young. Strong men too, by the way. Each year, I see more evidence on the importance of muscle mass as the key to staying younger longer. So I produced my first strength training video in 1985, and that's that time period when I first heard about Dr. Wayne Westcott, who's our next guest. He was lecturing, writing articles, and involved in cutting edge research about strength training. He was answering all the questions, how much, how often, do I lift heavy, light, slow, fast, when, where, how? Why is it so important? When it comes to strength training, Wayne was and still is the go-to expert and deep source of knowledge for maintaining strength at any age. He's the author of over 25 books, including Strength Training Past 50 and thousands of articles. So after listening to Wayne, you'll probably start tweaking your exercise routine a little bit. Wayne, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kathy, it's an honor to be on your show. So let's start out right away. So many people go on diets, and when they go on the diet, it's that first week, and they look down at the scale and they go, oh my God, I lost four pounds. Now, according to you, they maybe shouldn't be as excited about that four pounds, depending where it comes from. Can you explain? Absolutely, Kathy. When a person reduces calories or increases calorie consumption, like doing an exercise program, they will lose weight. However, if they lose weight at a relatively rapid rate, and for most women that be more than two to three pounds per week, that weight is not coming exclusively from fat. We can lose about two pounds of fat per week. A, a really large person could lose maybe three pounds of fat per week, but anything more than that could be coming from other sources. And the main source is muscle. We actually lose muscle tissue on most diets, average diets, 25% of the weight lost is muscle. Someone said, well, I lost 25 pounds, or, yeah, 25 pounds of my muscle. Well, about five to six of those pounds, would, uh, <laughs> they lost 25 pounds on their diet, excuse me, about five to six of those pounds would be from muscle, not from fat. And that's not a good thing because when you lose muscle, the metabolism slows down and it makes it much easier for the weight to come back on. And especially as we get older. So as we said in the introduction, you, you're, you're growing, you're expanding, you're putting more muscle on until about the age of 30. And then about that third decade, you start to lose muscle mass. Um, what I'm finding in the fourth, the fifth, the sixth decade is maintaining muscle mass becomes much more difficult. So let's talk about this process and why it's important to maintain muscle. You're absolutely correct. As we go through the aging process, we average about five pounds of muscle loss per decade during the midlife years. But for both men and women, once they hit about age 50 or postmenopausal ages, that muscle loss increased so it's closer to about 10 pounds per decade that's a lot of muscle loss and when you lose muscle oh my god that's then, crazy though when you think about it it's absolutely crazy right yes well um, as you were mentioning be before we started talking strong women stay young miriam nelson uh had a book by that name years ago she did a lot of research at tufts university 
And she found with her postmenopausal women, they were not only losing about 20% of their bone every decade, but they were losing up to 10 pounds of their muscle mass um, you know, in those postmenopausal years, which again leads to uh, metabolic rate reduction that always results in fat gain. Okay, so the, the question is though, you're gonna start strength training. A, a woman's gonna start strength training. I'm directing this more to women. Obviously it works for men and women, but you're gonna start a strength training program. So the question is, lightweights, heavyweights, which is better? We, we would, <laughs> I think most of the exercise physiologists that have done research in this area would say that heavier weights would be more productive. It is possible to build muscle with lighter weights if you do a lot of repetitions, but it's a challenging way to train for most people. So the average that we recommend is about you know, 75% of your maximum resistance. So if you could lift uh, you know, 20 pounds once, you would train with 15 pounds, that's about 75% of your maximum. And most of us would do about eight to 12 repetitions with that percentage of our maximum weight, which is a, a very good, safe, effective uh, weight load or resistance to use. It's not too much, it's not too little. It will produce muscle gain and bone gain and metabolic increase and a, a variety of other benefits if you train in that range. Okay, the, now the, the question though is, um, we do have Pilates bar, a um, lot of light, light weight overload where you do a lot of repetitions. So can you tell us what's the benefit of those type of workouts? Because I know sure. I see changes when I do, if I, if I switch over and do a really um, intense yoga practice for let's say a month, I notice big changes in my arms and shoulders, even though it's, 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 a, it's kind of time under tension, I have, mm -hmm lighter weight, but I'm doing a lot more of it. Is that still as beneficial? It can be. You're, um, there's a continuum, Kathy, where you have heavier weights and obviously fewer repetitions. That'd be on the strength end of the continuum. And then as you go to lighter weights and lighter weights and lighter weights and more repetitions or more time under tension, as you said quite accurately, now it moves a little more towards muscle endurance benefits, a little less in the muscle strength. However, there is a standard for building muscle strength, and that standard is to take your muscles to fatigue, the target muscles to fatigue, within what we call the anaerobic energy system. There's your aerobic system, which you are the expert at, and the many years that you've led this area of, of, of exercise, and that's for the car and cardiovascular system, as well as weight loss and a variety of other things. But the anaerobic energy system is generally considered to be 90 seconds or less. So if you fatigue the target muscles within 60, 70, 80, 90 seconds, you're going to have a major benefit in terms of adding muscle mass, adding bone mass, uh, increasing muscle strength, and to some degree muscle endurance as well. If you go longer than that, um, with a lighter weight, you will still get some of those benefits, and there may be some some additional adaptations that play, play, take place like in your mitochondria, et cetera. So either way is fine as long as you go to fatigue, but for strength, muscle mass and bone mass, doing that within about 90 seconds seems to be more beneficial. Yeah, I like to play around with both. I definitely like heavy weights. And by the way, I just took this challenge. It's called the Chad 1000. This is a Navy SEAL. Uh, tremendous guy he committed suicide after his uh, after he came back from being overseas and the chad 1000 is 1000 step ups on a 24 inch bench and what i've found is that i'm doing them in 100 uh, 100 step up increments daily and as I start to adapt, I now put more load on. The, the real Chad 1000, you're supposed to be having a pack on that's about 30 pounds. But I have about eight pounds on. And what I notice is that amazing thing of adaptation, which means the first ones, I'm, you know, I do no weight, maybe a lower bench. Bench goes a little higher, then I add weight. Pretty soon, I'm up to about 500 right now, and I'm going to do these next 500. I assume I'm gonna go a little higher in weight, but that's this principle that you have discussed forever, and it's, it's really trying to get women to understand that just keep, just keep finding ways to get yourself to fatigue within that 90 seconds. Wow, 
that's uh, that's pretty impressive. Two feet step ups. That's a lot, <laughs> especially with added weight. That's definitely a strength workout. You're doing amazing. Of course, you haven't changed in the many years that I've known you. You're exactly the same. You're probably even more fit. But uh, that's a great workout. Well, but but to thank you so much for that. I didn't mean to like <laughs> put that out there for the for the uh, you know for those compliments. But one of the things I have found is that find different ways to stre to put stress on your body. So let's talk about those some other changes because we always think about the muscle changes that happen in our body. What else happens on the cellular level, uh, brain function, other functions in your body? What happens when you start a really good strength training workout? That, that's a wonderful question, and I'm, I'm going to give you quite a few answers to that because there are a lot of benefits to resistance exercise, including the ones you just said. I'm going to reiterate, you, you increase your muscle strength, you increase your muscle endurance, you increase your muscle mass, you increase your bone mass or bone density, you increase your resting metabolic rate, which means you're burning more calories uh, 24 hours a day. People who don't strength train, even if they're doing aerobics, if they don't strength train, every pound of muscle burns about six calories per day at rest, just for normal you know, function and maintenance. But people who do strength train two or more times a week, their uh, skeletal muscles burn 50% more, nine calories per pound per day. So metabolism is important. And when you strength train and your metabolism goes up, you automatically reduce body fat, you reduce resting blood pressure, you reduce uh, your blood cholesterol levels, at least your LDLs, the bad cholesterol, the HDL always goes up, which is wonderful news. You decrease your HbA1c or your blood sugar. You uh, reduce the risk of diabetes, heart disease, stroke, many types of cancer, low back pain, arthritis. I mean, the list just goes on. These are all documented research benefits. Uh, with several studies in support of these. In terms of the psychological or the cognitive benefits, definitely there's been several studies that have shown cognitive enhancement, especially in older adults, and especially early signs of dementia can be delayed with strength training. We've done some studies in all the areas I just mentioned, but also in terms of emotional health or psychological health, we see um, major improvements in physical self-concept and tranquility and a variety of other things for people who add strength training to their program. We've also seen a decrease in the um, symptoms of depression, clinical depression. So across the board, and perhaps the most important, which I didn't address, you can add nuclei to your muscle cells, which is wonderful. That explains the muscle memory aspect of stopping training and coming back to it. You can increase the mitochondria, the cell powerhouses. You can certainly improve insulin sensitivity and glycemic control, which reduces the possibility or the probability, I should say, with one out of three Americans uh, predicted to have diabetes by the year 2050. So a lot of things happen when you do resistance exercise, just as they do with aerobic exercise. And in fact, several studies now, and in almost all of our studies, we do both, have shown that the combination is, is far superior to either one alone. Okay, so that list is, is, is so impressive, but so how much is enough? I mean, how much is it, you hear varying uh, prescriptions. Is it twice a week, total body, three times a week? And as you're answering that, also jump in with, is it isolate or more functional training that you're recommending, which means more total body movement? Okay, very, very good questions. We've done research on some of those uh, areas. We found that two or three days a week for beginning exercisers works exactly the same. After 10 weeks of training, they add, we're doing two or three days a week, they're adding 3.1 pounds of new muscle, which is pretty impressive. They're also losing uh, about 3.9 pounds of fat. That's without any dietary intervention. So people don't have to worry about getting bigger in terms of adding weight. They typically lose more fat than they gain muscle if they're not in good shape as you are to start with. So two or three days a week works fine for uh, beginners. If you prefer to split your routines and maybe do upper body twice a week and lower body twice a week, that is fine. Or if you split it even further and do, you know, chest and triceps on Mondays and, and Thursdays and back and biceps on Tuesdays and Fridays and legs and shoulders on Wednesday and Saturdays, that is fine too. But you do need to recover about 48 hours as a beginning exerciser in order for the muscles to remodel, rebuild, restructure, and become stronger and, and 
you gain some of their mass. For advanced participants, such as yourself, actually you need to do less frequent training. It takes you longer to recover and remodel because you're training harder. Now that doesn't mean you, you, you stop training, but it means you might go to a split routine like I just said. You need about 72 hours of recovery time so you could do you know, certain muscles on Mondays and Thursdays, others on Tuesdays and Fridays, others on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and do just fine. In our studies, because we're dealing with typically middle-aged, overweight women in most of our studies, whether it's an osteoporosis study or, or, or weight loss study or weight maintenance study or back injury study, those are our typical subjects that we use, our typical participants. And when you're working with individuals such as those, we do just one set of each exercise to muscle fatigue. However, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends as you become more fit, and if you, you don't have other limitations, doing two to four sets per muscle group. So you might do two different exercises or two sets of the same exercise for your shoulders. Or you might do three sets of, of, of bench presses for your chest. Or you might do three different exercises for one set. But that those are the guidelines and our research would definitely support those guidelines as being very effective. In terms of doing multiple joint exercises versus single joint, for the most part, I recommend multiple joint, for example, leg presses or squats would be a multiple joint exercise, a leg extension, a leg curl, those would be single joint, they would be more isolating. So I, I generally recommend multiple joint exercise, but for certain muscle groups, especially in the core, uh, and particularly for the lower back, which is probably the most important muscle group in the body since 80% of Americans are going to experience low back pain if they don't do something about their low back weakness and sitting all the time in front of screens. Um, I would recommend that some exercises you might want to isolate and really work them very carefully, but very productively. Great, and I'm glad you, you know, I'm glad you're giving us this information because it's interesting. Because I do train hard, I have noticed that it takes more time to recover, and um, I need sleep. You know, that's the thing. Those, that's the combination. Which I know, as I was doing research for our uh, podcast today, and you know, reading some of the articles in the New York Times and all the articles, because you've done, my gosh, thousands of articles, written, been in, et cetera. And one of the things that I think people overlook is the recovery and also the sleep element that you have to repair these tissues in order for you to grow stronger. Am I, am I on the right track? I, I wish I had said it because those are absolutely the most important factors. The strength training by itself um, will not work unless, uh, I'm gonna give you a couple things in addition. Number one, the sleep. The sleep, the sleep, the sleep. That's the restorative sleep. That's when your muscles remodel, rebuild during sleep, sound sleep, not just rest, but sleep, very important. Number two is as we age, we do not process protein as well. So when we're younger, we might use say 80% of the protein that we intake. As we're older, that may drop you know, to only 40% of the protein or 50% of the protein that we intake. So we may need a little more protein as we age as well. And then the third thing is water. Water, muscle is about 25% protein, but it's about 75% water. And most older adults, and, and you're not one, but I am, we need to drink more water and we need to make a point to say, okay, I want to drink an extra quart of water, just as an example. Um, work up to an extra quart of water than what I'm normally drinking because we do need that, especially for doing aerobic or anaerobic training. Uh, and again, muscles are mostly water. So water, protein, and sleep are absolutely critical to maintaining or developing and maintaining a strong musculoskeletal system as we age. Well, I start my mornings off two 10 ounce glasses of water. I mean, first thing, before anything, squeeze some lemon in it and just the the hydration i'm i'm big in starting my day and getting and getting hydrated and then of course throughout the day but i find that if i get it going in the morning that I, i'm more likely to maintain it um the other thing is this protein and thanks for bringing that up um, because there are the debates and I, we're not going to get into diet on this show but we have you know the ketos the carnivores the vegetarians the vegans and i i interview lots of different people. And when it comes to protein, there's uh, there's been a little bit of controversy around it. Like as we age, um, you know, we, you know, some people are saying we don't need as much protein, but 
to your point, other people are also saying, we don't absorb enough protein. I know for myself that when I get adequate su supplies of protein, I feel stronger. But give us, give us some of the latest research, again, on protein, where's the sweet spot, and maybe get into before working out, after working out, or does it really matter? Do we just have to get enough throughout the day? Oh, great questions. So we follow the guidelines by Dr. Carolina Povey, and she's a a world famous medical doctor, practicing physician here in Boston at one of the major hospitals. But she's also a great nutritionist and she's written numerous books and um, we followed her protein guidelines in all of our research studies with again, middle aged and older adults, mostly women in all of our weight loss studies and our osteoporosis studies, et cetera. And she recommends 0.7 grams of protein per pound of ideal body weight. You're, 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 you know, you're, best body weight, what you should weigh. If, if you weigh 150, but should weigh 120, we'd go with the 120. So 0. 0.7 grams per pound of body weight per day. And uh, we So can you just do us a favor, and just uh, just to put that in real, in real terms, uh, let's just do our math right there. So let's just say 120, and you want to get 0. 0.7, so you're talking about maybe 84 grams. But to, right. what does that mean? Uh, let's just talk about what does that mean, like uh, in terms of an egg or a chicken breast, or how would you right. get that through the course yeah. of the day? A chicken breast, most, most, um, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying you should eat meat or not meat, um, or fish or chicken or however you want to go, or vegetarian or vegan. But for example, chicken breast or fish, lean meat, they would have about seven grams of protein per ounce. So if you had six ounces of, of chicken or fish or whatever, that'd be about 40, 40 to 45 grams of protein right there. A glass of milk would be maybe eight, an egg would be maybe six. All of that would be in the egg white. So there are many ways you can get protein during the day, and we, we do it both, we've done research both ways. I think just getting it during the day is, is fine, but in our studies, because we're doing research, we use shakes, we can actually match how much protein they're getting, how much they're adding to their diet, getting enough of it, we use shakes for a lot of things. And we've used uh, post-exercise shakes in many of our studies. And just to give you an example, and again, there, there, there's debate on this and there are research going both ways. We've done a number of studies on this, and for our osteoporosis study, those who did just the strength training versus those who did the strength training and took the post-exercise protein shake, there was only 24 grams of protein. It wasn't anything huge. Uh, no one had any trouble with that. Um, it was a 1% difference in, in the amount of bone density gained. In our weight loss studies, we do the same thing. We do a post-exercise shake or, or in some of them, in others, we'll actually do a meal substitute shake. And we've always had better results when we've had the shake than when we don't. For example, when people add strength training to a diet program, they don't lose as much muscle. But we've only found in studies where they also add extra protein, because when you diet, you cut across the board typically, and so you're losing some protein as well. So when they add protein and the strength training, we've seen they not only reduce the muscle loss, but they actually concurrently lose fat and gain muscle, which is remarkable because most diets, as I said, you lose about 25% you know, of the weight loss is muscle. It's quite a bit of muscle. That's why 90% of all dieters, successful dieters, regain the weight back. So we want to maintain the muscle. And we have found that, that middle-aged and older women um, do very well with Dr. Apovian's, uh, again, she's a best-selling author as well, um, with that recommendation. Others would say less than that is fine, but um, we've had no problems with that, so we're going we're gonna to stick with it. 0. Wow. 0.7 grams per pound body weight. I like that. Well, it's interesting also because once you start exploring all the plant kingdom also, I mean, I do a, I do a shake. I love shakes and I do a, a daily shake, but then there's hemp parts. I also, you can throw in garbanzo beans. I mean, in salads, there's, there's so many different ways of getting protein from plants and animals. And I think that's the one thing that um, I'm just trying to educate people more and more about. There's so many different sources of protein. Just make sure when you're making that, uh, that shake, whether you decide to put in whey or vegan protein, that you can also supplement with other little things in there that even ups the, the protein amount. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate that feedback. And let's just then extend that into um, belly fat, because honestly, <laughs> That is the number one question. I'm sure you, everybody, anybody over the age of like, and especially women over the age of 40, it's like, okay, the belly. So from the standpoint of the fat, but also getting back to the strength training, the core, are you, 
And what have your studies shown? Is it better to do like, okay, I'm going to do my sit-ups right now and my crunches, or is it just like start to do these full body motions with our planks and our push-ups and everything else where we're using our core, or is it a mix of everything? You know, I hate to say this, but I think it can be either or, uh, or all of the above. Uh, I, I prefer to, I, I do trunk curls, about a thousand of them every day. I've done it for the last 50 years. You do how nothing. many? Oh, say yeah, it again. A thousand. Just the easy trunk curls in the morning. It's how I wake up before I drink my water and my shake, like you, okay? But but, but, but just nothing. so just so right. I'm, because I don't know that term. I should know. Are you talking about trunk curl is just do do do? Yeah, like okay. A, half, a quarter sit up. Quarter. And it does nothing for my abs at all. <laughs> I, I get on the ab machine, I put on, you know, 150 pounds or so, and I do a set of 10 or a couple sets. And I'm sore for a couple of days. So I respond better to higher intensity, fewer reps, like a standard strength training program. But certainly, um, I just had my class today, um, one of my college classes, and we went over abs. And they all came up with different ab exercises. They're all excellent. Um, we, you know, they, some of us, we did planks. We did planks with push-ups because push-ups are, you know, going to get your chest and shoulders and triceps as well as your abs because doing a plank. We did a lot of things. And they all, it, they all work as long as you work them. Um, so yeah and that's a good point and I'm really big you can't just call it in you can't just I mean it's it's what's activating the move like you could be doing that curl up uh, that trunk curl and you could be throwing your shoulders and neck and just like huh, you know that and and maybe doing very little with your core or you could be you know you could be going act and that's one of the things years ago and I don't know if you remember this I don't know who designed this but there was something called touch you know touch therapy or something like that but sometimes sure. almost every day on my body I'll, I'll, I'll touch something like even when I'm doing those step ups I'll touch my inner thigh toward the because it's like engage engage okay wake that up so I'm not rolling out or rolling and the same thing is with the abs I mean almost every day before I start I also I've been doing it for so long and yet still I go am I doing this am I am I getting what part of my ab lower part of the abdominals or upper or all the more you do it, oh my gosh, it's amazing how much you can activate in that in that area. Isn't that something? Kind of like the mind-body connection there. But I did want to say something about your first question on this topic, and that was when women hit menopause for reasons no one understands, but we saw this years and years and years ago. I'm sure you did too, because we do body composition testing. Before menopause, women typically are, if they, you know, if they have extra fat, it, it's like the pear shape, it's in the thighs. That's where most of the fat cells are from, you know, from birth, from genetics. But once they hit menopause, that changes and they start depositing fat in the intra-abdominal area, just as men do. And they lose their, uh, some of their resistance to heart disease and those type of things, because you don't want fat in that visceral area. That's a bad place to have fat. And that's where it goes for both men and women after, you know, after age 50, men all their life, but women after age 50. And interesting, there have been several studies. We have not done these studies. We don't have the permit to do these. But people who have, and there are several of them, have shown that strength training is absolutely the best thing you can do to reduce intra-abdominal or visceral fat. So definitely, if you have an issue with fat in that area, include some strength training or some resistance exercise or some good ab work, like, like you would be able to give them better than I could, I'm sure, um, as part of your routine because it's really important. Well, that's a big light bulb aha moment because most people think, okay, I have a little extra belly fat, I'm gonna go for a run or I'm gonna do my rowing machine and do all cardio. And so it's, and, and yet we know that strength training can be the most powerful tool in, in getting rid of some of this belly fat. So I appreciate that, that tip, but let's go into um, another area. I know I only have you for a few more minutes. As we age, um, maintaining, I, I, how do I say it? Like, muscles become a woman's, like, they used to, like, you, I want diamonds, and I want, to, <laughs> like, something, but now it's like, give me my muscle, because honestly, it is not as easy to maintain um, with, with each decade. So my question is, we know if we're not training, that we need to train. But even if we're training, 
you, you have changes in hormones, which I want to kind of get into because that impacts it. And that's, and the other thing is just this nerve innervation or another way of saying that is kind of what I was talking about before. I remember teaching classes and wanting somebody to activate their glute when they're going to do a lunge and they couldn't find their glute. Like I would touch their glute and that sounds horrible, but I'm saying I'd ask permission first of all, but or I'd have them touch it and it's like, it's all in the quad or it's all somewhere else. Explain this idea of nerves and how we have to, we have to turn things on and what happens when we age with the nervous system. Yeah, it, that, right. You've hit everything, the nail right on the head and every topic, I can't believe this. Uh, it's all about the neuromuscular system. I'm emphasizing the neuro. As we age, um, the nerves, the motor units, which is the, the, the motor nerve coming out of your central nervous system that goes to, to the muscles to innervate a motor unit, which is, would be all the muscle fibers connected to that nerve. And as we age, things happen that aren't necessarily good, and we start to, um, to, to lose size in our muscle fibers, especially the fast twitch fibers. And then pretty soon, you know, we start to lose some of those fibers themselves. Uh, neurological you know, degradation is is the biggest factor in why we don't run as fast or, or lift as much. Um, the muscles are innervated by nerves and we have to, again, maintain um, some some semblance of focus on the muscles we're using because we really focus on the nerves that innervate them. And I like your idea of, of that touch or at least, you know, explaining it very carefully. So you need to feel it right here. You have to concentrate in this area. It really helps. But yes, it's as we age, we, we do lose uh, muscle, and that's, I think, mostly because of the neurological decay that, that occurs. And as part and of that, is, is part of that because the nerves come out of the spine, and as our vertebrae and as our spine starts to you know, maybe decompress some, some of the, there's pressure on that, or is it just, is there something that's just too much for us to even go into right now? There's pro it's probably uh, a very deep subject. <laughs> <laughs> it's over my head, Kathy. You're, you're ahead it's of over me my this. pay grade. <laughs> I don't know the reasons for it, honestly, but I know that it, I, I'm very convinced that we need to deal with the neuromuscular system, just like we deal with the, 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 the musculoskeletal system or the cardiovascular system. We can't separate the heart from the vessels. You can't separate the muscles from the bones, and you can't separate the nerves from the muscles. And the best thing to do is to train them, to train them, to train them, and to keep the, the human growth hormone. And for males, of course, would be testosterone, uh, active and functioning as long as you can. Uh, it helps everything. Well, um, maybe just uh, then finishing off, you said in your last answer or, uh, uh, that we start to lose fast twitch. And what what I've been told and what I've noticed is that it's, it's this, um, they're called super fast twitch. I know they're, I think they're type 2B or something. The super, and that's those explosive muscles. And that's yes. where we can get up off the couch. Or to your point, we can run fast or we can react quickly. And those seem to be the first ones to go. Is that, am I correct in saying that? A absolutely. You're 100% correct. Um, I shouldn't use the word preferentially, but that's, that's what we lose first. We always lose the fast twitch. So, you know, a younger person, they start to fall, they can catch themselves. An older person, those would be those fast twitch reactive fibers and they're they're not operational at the same level. So they fall and they don't catch themselves and they, they tend to have a, a higher injury when they fall. So you wanna avoid falling, <laughs> number one, or you wanna be really strong if you do fall but, so that you can you know absorb that with your muscles and catch it. But yes, you're absolutely correct. So um, I used to be an 800 meter runner like your daughter who's an Olympian. Um, and uh, boy, when you get my age, you know, it's about twice as slow, not, not, not just a little slower. You really start slowing down after age, even 40, but certainly after age 50 in everything that requires uh, powerful muscle movements. Well, okay, then, then we'll end with this because you just, I, I like where you're going there. Most people think of aging as whatever, however old you are, it's older than that. So I remember I used to think 56 was old and now it's like, oh, well, that's so young. But the point being, aging is, especially when it comes to the muscles and the body, starts around in the 30s and it's imperceptible at first, 
but then you hit 40 and it's going, wow, I can't eat quite as much anymore, or, or I, I, I can't lift this anymore, I'm not getting aches and pains. But my thing is, obviously the suggestion is start young so that you can build this base and uh and then but is it ever too late to start and i know we want to g give everybody hope that it's never too late to start but never is there a point that, that that okay go ahead sorry go for it never too late we just had a woman in, in our, our class outside my door here um who came into our form with osteoporosis at age 80. This was 11 years ago, the study that we did on osteoporosis. She went from osteoporosis to osteopenia to no, no bone loss for her age. She was right where she should be within nine months of the strength training and protein program. She wow, asked, that today, is... I said, I said, Gladys, you're now 91. That was 11 years ago. I said, how's your bone? She said, I still don't. I haven't reverted back to osteopenia yet. 11 years in her 80s. My goodness, now she's been with us, she's been training. We've done several nursing home studies with nine-year-olds, and in 14 weeks of doing just that simple form I said, in fact, in the nursing home, we only did five exercises, one set each, twice a week, they had four pounds of lean weight, that's muscle, within you know three and a half months. At age 90, you, it's never too old to improve your health and fitness, especially your musculoskeletal system, the muscles and the bones. Getting faster is not going to happen, <laughs> but getting stronger, having more muscle, more bone, which I think is incredibly important, can occur at any age. Okay, we're going to end on that because that is such a high note. So thank you for uh, joining me. It's always a pleasure. And uh, we're going to have to keep this up like maybe once every three or four years. And we'll keep comparing notes because it's so much fun talking to you and uh, going on this journey together. So big kiss, big hug. and. Hope thank to see you. you one of these days at maybe uh, a convention or something. Oh, thank you. My honor and privilege to be on your show. Bye-bye <laughs> now. You know, it's such a pleasure having Wayne on the show. My big takeaway from all this is that not only does strength training increase your lean muscle mass, it helps burn more calories, not only while you're doing it, but throughout the day, and it protects your back from pain. Strength training also has the ability to expand the possibilities of what you're capable of doing throughout your entire life. And then on top of all that, it helps improve your memory. Now, that's a big, long list. So in other words, strength training can give you a more energetic lifestyle as you age. It helps you stay younger longer and live more vibrantly. So start caring for your muscles by strength training at least twice a week. If you're unsure where to start, join me for a workout anywhere in the world with Fit Over 40. It's a free program that includes 14 days of workouts, from strength training to HIIT training, from bar method to ab routines, and so much more. Plus, the private Facebook group. It's a community of over 50,000 people, and the members are so encouraging, and they keep you up to date on what's happening in the challenge and keep you more accountable. All you have to do is go to kathysmith.com to join. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, I want you to really think about all those other episodes out there that you might use while you're doing the dishes or while you're walking. You might want to check out Dr. Alan Christensen's show on how to turn off cortisol for a deep night's sleep, for a good night's sleep. And then there's the episode on what if you have leaky gut? Well, our conversation with Dr. Axe was awesome. That's episode 12. And if you're thinking like, okay, I got to check the memory a little bit, Dr. Andrew Budson's interview was classic. It's number 69, and you can find out some really t great tips to keep your memory sharp. So go to kathysmith.com slash podcast. Now, the podcast is available wherever you listen, so just search The Art of Living, whether you're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify, and you'll find all the other episodes. And believe me, you can start to use these anytime, again, while you're walking, while you're doing dishes, while you're driving. So make use of all this great information. And to all of you out there, I love you to death. Here's to your health.